So this will be the second part of uh, Professor uh, Francois Garutat's uh, lecture. Okay. You could start, right? All right, uh, thank you. So I'm now going to talk in, in general terms about uh, the classical notion of convex co-compact uh, actions in, uh, in hyperbolic space, and also about this more recently introduced notion in the in the projective space. So let gamma <clears throat> be a discrete group. And just for the sake of concreteness, I'm going to focus on actions on the hyperbolic plane, but really uh, most definitions make sense in in uh, in much greater generality. An action uh, is called proper if you have this uh, this situation where for any compact subset uh, it's chased away by all all but finitely many uh, elements. So the, the collection of elements that fail to push it away, the, the elements such that gamma k intersects the k, this collection is finite. When that happens, the you can talk about the, the quotient H2 mod gamma as a Hausdorff space. And in fact, it's going to be a hyperbolic surface, possibly with torsion points. So I, so I have to say hyperbolic uh, orbifold in the case of uh, finite order elements. So here are some examples. Um, H2 is the, the orange disk always. And if I take a 4n gone, a 4g gone, and identify opposite sides, and the, the angles match up, and I'm going to get a genus G surface, famously. Uh, so in this case, the, the uh, quotient is compact, and I can find a compact fundamental domain upstairs. Next <clears throat> is an example where uh, the quotient is non-compact. I identify, I take such a such an ideal quadrilateral connecting four ideal points, and I glue opposite sides together. So it's sort of like a, a, a the construction for a torus, where you take a rectangle and, and identify opposite ed edges, except the corners. Oh, sorry, except the corners are missing. And so in the quotient, you get uh, you get this torus with a point missing. It's a it's a torus with a cusp. Um, uh, so it's non-compact. Right? The, the diameter of this thing is is infinite. You should uh, you should think of this spike as having infinite length. It has infinite length because it's at infinity in uh, in this uh, in these uh, spikes of the fundamental domain. So here the fundamental domain has finite area. The quotient has finite area, but uh, they are not compact. And third is a situation where I just shifted the, the, the lines here a little bit apart from each other. and uh, But otherwise, I continue to identify opposite edges together by translations. Then what you get in the quotient has these giant funnels, or has one giant funnel. Um, which is in this case, uh, I have to name these elements. If this is A and this is B, then this here is A, B, A bar, B bar, the, the commutator. Uh, so that's a situation where uh, the quotient is non-compact. But it, it's very tempting to say that it has a compact part. Plus a boring uh, funnel. Right? So, so these funnels are just infinite uh, annuli. And the compact part uh, glues to the, to the funnel along a geodesic boundary. And by contrast, this uh, first example was compact. And this example was 
non contact but finite area and all of these are examples of uh, proper actions now when you have such a proper action uh, or any action really in general but it, it, it makes more it makes uh, uh, sense of, I mean, it's only relevant for proper actions for us you can talk about the limit set so what is the limit set you take any base point in h2 you take its orbit take the closure of the orbit so the closure is in h2 union its boundary at infinity and then you keep only the part that's in the boundary at infinity so the closure is i have to put the, the natural topology on the on h2 union its boundary at infinity and this is a closed ball. The action is what you think it is. It just extends the, the, the projective action. And that again is a is a is a compactification that you can construct in quite in general. When you have a, a delta hyperbolic space, you can glue it to its boundary at infinity and get something compact that it impacts on. So that's fully general, and, and we can talk about the limit set. Uh, lambda gamma, lambda is for limit. Uh, and from this, we can construct the convex hull. So that would be uh, in the in the third example above, the convex hull, well, the lambda gamma would be this counter set that I, that I drew in green. And the convex hull is this infinite polygon. And since convexity or convex hulls are, are, a, are an equivariant notion under the, the projective action on the disk. Uh, we can talk about the, the convex hull of this limit set. Uh, uh, sorry, we can talk about the quotient of this convex hull. The, the convex hull is gamma equivariant, so it defines something in the quotient, which we call the convex core. So I draw it with the with the heart, which stands for core, convex core of gamma. Uh, that's the convex hull C gamma C modulo the gamma action. It's a subset <clears throat> of the of the portion surface S, and there's these, these little gymnastics that you can try to uh, to get familiar with for moving between the universal cover and the uh, and the quotient, where um, well the boundary of the convex core in the quotient corresponds to these. Uh, lines to, to, to these sides of the convex hull upstairs and each of them has a stabilizer uh, isomorphic to z uh, so there's a certain boundary length here that that we that we see in the quotient as the as the length of this uh, curve and uh, what else can we say well the convex core is geodesically convex which is just another way of saying that it lifts to something convex or of saying that if you take any path between two points in the convex core, then you can uh, deform it continuously to a, to a geodesic segment that stays in the convex core. So here are some key properties. The, uh, lambda gamma, the limit set, is homeomorphic to the uh, the boundary at infinity of the group if so I should have I should have written this here if uh, the convex core is compact so it's a realization Right. In this lambda gamma, the, the set of uh, limiting values in, in the boundary of H2, is a realization of the abstract boundary of the discrete group uh, gamma. Note, note that for a general uh, representation that's not convex co compact, sorry, did I, did I define convex co compact? Mm -hmm. 
So by, I'm sorry, that should have, should have been a sentence for this effect. So this by definition means gamma as a, a subgroup of isometries of H2 is convex co-compact. Um, so when it's convex or compact, you have uh, you have an, embed an embedding of the of the abstract uh, limit set of the group into the, the boundary of H two. If you have a general discrete representation, not necessarily uh, convex or compact, then you still have a map from its boundary to uh, the boundary of H two, but it may be non-injected. For example. When you have uh, parabolic elements, like in the in the cast example that, that we showed before, then well, what about these parabolic elements? This is this is uh, this example right here. Well, if you take an uh, uh, powers of the uh, the commutator a b a inverse b inverse, then they are going to accumulate. To the same point whether you you iterate forward or back so that means that the the forward and backward limit points of the commutator map to the same point in the in the image of uh, h2 in, in the in the boundary of h2 so another way you could see the transition right you can trans transition continuously from this convex co-compact situation to the cusp situation and what happens as you transition is that this limit set that was a cantor set gets bigger and bigger. Its, it's Hausdorff dimension goes up until, well, until these two points merge, right? But that's at the same time, these two points merge. And at the same time, each little open interval gets collapsed to a point. And uh, you, you have a, a sort of a continuous transition from the cantor set to the whole circle. So that's quite quite striking, uh, and in fact, it's only one of the ways that you can degenerate in the boundary of the convex co-compact representations. It's sort of the, the simplest, most basic way of degenerating. Uh, right. So gamma plus being the the element in the boundary at infinity of gamma. Uh, it's the forward limit point of an element gamma. Different from gamma minus, but but they, the action uh, maps them to the same ideal point. Uh, now another key property of the of this convex core is that it contains every closed geodesic of S. So in a sense, it contains all the dynamics. This is uh, another way of saying that a if you have a curve that visits the funnel and then does whatever. Uh, well, if you straighten it to a geodesic, it's going to to no longer visit the funnel. The funnel has a. If you enter the funnel and you are geodesic, then you you, you go to infinity in the funnel, and there's no way of coming out. It's only a z. Uh, it's an annulus with only a z in, in its uh, fundamental group. So, <clears throat> yeah, definition, we say that the that the group gamma or, or its representation, its, its inclusion in the isometries of H2, both terminologies exist. We say that it's convex co-compact if the convex core is compact. And the key, really, the, the motivating property of the, the motivating uh, feature of this whole uh, domain is that Convex co-compactness is an open property. If you have a convex co-compact representation and you deform it a little bit, it's going to be still convex co-compact. And whenever we try to generalize the uh, convex co-compactness to uh, to other contexts, that that's will, that will always be the the main feature that we try to preserve. I'm going to give an idea of how we <clears throat> how the proof of this goes. Um, 
I'm going to prove it in two dimensions and then ju just say, that, say a few words about uh, Hn. So the first thing you do is you enlarge the convex core to a surface with polygonal boundary. So the convex core was this thing with a uh, geodesic boundary. You can push out a little bit and make it uh, polygonal, uh, meaning that there are some corners, there are some angles, less than pi, in between the corners, uh, your geodesic segments. You can do this at every at every funnel. Now you have this strictly convex shape. And <clears throat> the key observation is that convexity upstairs is checked just three vertices at a time. If you check that this is convex, and the next three are convex, and the next three are convex, and so on, up to the gamma action, there's only finitely many such consecutive triples, then the whole thing is geodesically convex. So convexity is checked locally between three orbits, and there's only a finite number of orbits. So local convexity is preserved under small deformation. And we only need a, a general principle that if you have something low, if you have a, a manifold that's uh, ge locally geodesically convex and complete, then it's uh, it, it is in fact uh, convex. So here's the cartoon. You can produce for every small deformation rho prime of rho a simply connected hyperbolic surface with convex boundary and holonomy rho prime. So it's just a deformation. It's a uh, you can triangulate, for example, the, the the interior here in an equivariant fashion. And um, as you deform a little bit, there's only finitely many triangles to check, and uh, the so the, the, the gluing between them stays uh, stays uh, isometric, and the angles that they form on the, on the boundary of the, the region they tile uh, stay convex. So the the claim is that this is in fact a geodesically convex. And it's a thing that embeds in H two because, well, we can we can construct a developing map, right from the from the simplices of the triangulation to H2. And the only question is whether it's it's going to uh, to uh, fail to be injective, right? To map into its with, with some uh, some overlap. Right? That would be bad. And in fact that can't happen at all because the whole the whole um, if I take any two points in the in the space and look how they are mapped by the developing map, well, the whole segment in in the image of the developing map has to stay in the image of the de developing map, and there, there cannot be a. If I try to make the a path from A to B short as short as possible in the image of the developing map, it can never bump into the boundary because that would be a case of local non-convexity. In fact, everything is, is constantly convex. So the key word, I guess I... The key word is developing map. Um, okay, and remark that the, in this... Uh, Proof strategy transposes naturally to Hn if we can make sure that we can construct um, uh, polyhedral boundaries, I mean, polyhedral deformations of the convex core that are locally finite. And here it was automatic as soon as we took uh, a, a point and its orbit, automatically it had only finitely many neighbors. But in general, if you take orbit points on the outside of the of your convex core, and the, the, the convex core is uh, is down here somewhere, you take your orbit points. You have to make sure that the the triangulations that, that, that arise as convex holes are locally finite, uh, and that's not a 
that's not a terribly hard thing to check. You just have to make sure that you, you can prove that the if you take a uniform neighborhood of your convex core, then it's it's in a sense uniformly convex. There's a the, the Hessian that you could compute is a uh, has a uh, uh, singular values bound below. It's it's uniformly positive. And so you can just take a dense enough net of points and automatically the, the convex hull will, will be locally finite. So that means a point far away from this one will be behind the horizon. Uh, if, if I stand at this point and my horizon is given by my neighbors, by my combinatorial neighbors, then any point far enough will automatically be behind the horizon. OK. So here's an alternate definition that that would make sense in the in the context of um, <clears throat> delta hyperbolic spaces. An action on a delta hyperbolic space instead of H two is convex co-compact if it preserves a convex subset, and the quotient of that convex subset is compact. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about projective actions. So what is a <clears throat> what is the, the the main player from now on is the is this group PN uh, sorry this space projective N space and it's uh, it's automorphism group PGL N plus one of R. So inside of PN, I when I look at the domain omega, so domain means it's an open set. A domain omega, I call it properly convex if it's, uh, well, if I can put it in an affine chart. So an affine chart is a copy of uh, Rn. It's contained in some affine chart. It is, uh, in that affine chart, it's convex and bounded. So for example, the full affine chart would be convex, right? But it's not bounded. Or the other ways that that a convex set can be unbounded in an affine chart is, in fact, you take um, you take a convex set in the convex bounded set, and you multiply it by R k for some. Properly convex times RK is not properly convex, but it's in fact the, the general shape of non-properly convex objects. They are always properly convex times <clears throat> times some factor, some RK factor. So here I want to write not convex. And for an example of a thing that is properly convex, well, just Think of a convex subset of Rn, convex bounded subset of Rn. And we can study the action of its, of the stabilizer G or, or gamma, I guess I called it G here, uh, of such an omega in PGL n plus one. So some examples are, well, <clears throat> Hn uh, that we were discussing before is an example of the above, because if you take a ball or an ellipsoid in Rn, then there's a group of projective transformations that preserve it um, contained in uh, PGL n plus one. So that's the so-called projective model of, uh, of hyperbolic space. And another example, these two are almost the only examples that, that are easy to, to do, to describe explicitly. If you take a simplex of uh, maximal dimension in, in Pn, then its stabilizer has this structure. It's a, it's a semi-direct product of permutation matrices and diagonal positive matrices. Uh, here I should say positive matrices. So if you, this, this um, simplex here, is really the projectivization of the positive orthant, the, pro the projectivization of uh, 
and uh, and you can see that the that the that this group acts on it. So here I tried to draw. Uh, <clears throat> if if you restrict to uh, the the abelian factor here, then all three eigendirections are preserved, and so uh, a point. Well, the family of lines through these points are also preserved. And that's why I try to draw them. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this can be, if you like, uh, to look at, it, at, at things metrically, then <clears throat> just then observe that the um, there is a natural metric on, on all of these things. Namely, when you have omega, and you want to know the distance between two points of omega, there is this uh, segment, this straight line through the two points, P and Q. It exits omega in two points, xi and eta. And you can compute the cross ratio of the four points. That's a projectively well-defined quantity. You normalize it in this way so, so that you have zero, one, some mystery number, and infinity. And uh, the mystery number, when you take its log, it's essentially the distance that you want. Uh, if you put a one half in front, then this will, in fact, define the, the unit curvature metric uh, in the case of uh, of, uh, of an ellipsoid domain. Omega. omega is an ellipsoid. You recover Hn in the usual sense. And in the simplex, um, in, this, in this other case, where omega is a simplex, what you recover is a some some form of polyhedral uh, uh, unit ball. You, you you find a I can describe it here. It's R two together with a hexagonal uh, unit ball. All right. So in a sense, it's a very direct and uh, and uh, natural generalization of Hn. And you could ask the following question. When um, gamma is a subset of PGLn plus 1 that preserves some properly convex domain omega, and inside this properly convex domain omega acts co-compactly on some convex uh, subset k of omega, then is that a, a, a property that survives small deformations? So would that be a, a good generalization of convex co-compact? We pointed out that in the case of H2 or Hn, if omega is Hn, then this property uh, of having a, a co-compact domain that you act on is uh, is stable on the small deformation. So what about uh, what about the, the general context of uh, the general domain omega in P n? Uh, the answer is a uh, is uh, remarkably no. This naive generalization of of uh, convex co-compact. Uh, is not stable on the small deformations. And the counter example is as follows. You consider um, you consider the group generated by this one matrix, two, two, a quarter, powers of this matrix. So this acts on the positive orthant, like we said before. It fixes the, the eigendirections, uh, the, the standard basis. And it translates. It translates. Uh, its orbits look like um, the point here, and its orbit points just accumulate up here and down there, and they stay on a line because the because the two top eigenvalues are equal. In general, if you have a um, if you have a general, sorry, 
triangle. Uh, let, let me draw it here in the example. If you have a, a generic diagonal matrix acting by A, B, C, then its orbits will look like this. If, uh, if A, B, C form a geometric sequence, then, then these points lie on a conic. Uh, in general, they lie on, on some, some other kind of power curve, but it's, a, it's not a straight line. It becomes a straight line here exceptionally because uh, we have the same um, power. And as a result, as a K, as a, as a domain, as a co-compact domain, I can take any cone based on a, based on a compact uh, subset of the segment here. Of the base of omega, right? Because the the compact fundamental domain of this action would look like uh, would look like some some segment here. So that would be naively convex co-compact in the same in the sense above. We preserve omega and we have a k on which the action is co-compact. However, we can find small deformations that look like well, that that cause the um, block here, the identity block, to degenerate into a small rotation. Okay, so the, the powers of twice a rotation matrix and a, a quarter in the, the bottom entry here. If you look at how these elements act, well, they are going to uh, the, the, the orbit of a gen generic point will accumulate on the whole line through the first, the whole projective line through the first two uh, eigen directions. And it, it will, compared to the original orbit that I took, is going to escape along the line here and then rotate and then be converge more and more to a, to a rotation. Um, and so, since <clears throat> since the limit set would have to contain a full projective line, it cannot possibly be um, I mean, fit into a, a uh, an affine chart. So then there's no way that you could fit this into a, a, a convex domain omega epsilon. And uh, that shows that the, the naive properly and proper, uh, sorry, naive convex co-compactness property that I proposed upstairs was uh, not stable on the small deformation. Now, despite this, we can come up with a, we can provide a, a slightly less naive definition by saying the following. If you have a, an action on a set on a properly convex domain omega, and it's convex co-compact, not just on some uh, convex subdomain, but on the convex hull of all the limit points of all uh, omega orbits uh, in gamma. Right, so you you require what this would require you to do in 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 the example here is that you would have to take all limit points of all uh, elements of omega. That would be the full bottom segment. That's the, the top point. That would be the, be the full orbital limit set. What we call the full orbital limit set. So each of these points is the limit of some interior point of omega. If the quotient of the convex hull of that by omega is compact, which is not the case in, the, in this example, um, then we call it convex co-compact. And theorem, convex co-compact in this strengthened sense is an open condition. Um, okay. I, I am not going to um, prove the theorem today, but I want to give an idea of some of the tools it's not it's not illustrated. Uh, I have to live draw this. But some of the key tools
are uh, what's called Benzekri uh, normal position. It's a theory, it's a proposition by Benzekri that says um, if you take the space of all properly convex pointed sets. So um, omega in PM properly convex. An X an element of omega. And you divide this by PG L n plus one. Then that is compact. So in other words, when you have a a uh, When you have omega and maybe it's very deformed and x and maybe it's very close to the boundary, then you can always map it by uh, an, uh, an element of PGLN, PGLN plus one, sorry, to something that will be, uh, well, I can put it x in the center and I can um, ask. that omega stay bounded in between two balls, two, two completely uniform balls centered at x. So, um, the ratio of the radii bounded by uh, above by a constant depending only on the dimension. So this allows you to, um, this is what allows you to, to sort of treat all sets omega at the same time uh, in a uniform, I mean, when you need quantitative uh, estimates. So that's one key tool. Um, I don't know what I have more time for. I, um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to show an example of uh, Note. Uh, this is a theorem, really. Convex co compactness. In PN. is stable under taking free products. Uh, so for all uh, the gamma 
Gamma prime in PGL N. There exists uh, G. Well, yeah. I'm going to embed this group. GL n plus one, which is two, sorry. Um, there exists G in PGL n plus two, such that Assuming that gamma and gamma prime are convex for compact. The representation of gamma star gamma prime free product given by. Conjugating the second factor, G gamma prime G inverse, is convex co compact. So we <clears throat> we can make this work in uh, in the context of uh, of uh, projective representations, but I'm only going to show how to how to do it in uh, H2, just for simplicity. An idea in the context of H2, and maybe gamma equals gamma prime equals Z for uh, at first. Well, you, uh, the name uh, that people gave to this is ping pong. You have um, the main. The idea is that, that you, you need to, to conjugate uh, gamma prime out of the way. You, you, you take a little g that's very, very, very large, very, very um, far from the identity. So then you're going to have uh, first element gamma and the second one gamma prime and everything that uh, Okay, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to to draw convincing pictures because because the the elements have to have to, have to be so huge. Maybe I'll take uh, a an enormous convex domain around the axis of gamma. Okay, so this is k sub gamma. And then gamma prime is uh, a translation along an axis very far out here. And I also take a large ball for it. But the, the red ball is so large that the green balls can't even see each other. And this guy... Um, This guy here is behind the horizon. Does that make sense? 
Oh, peas. Uh, to say this is G gamma prime G inverse. And this is um, gamma times G gamma prime G inverse, gamma inverse. So uh, where gamma is, is an element of big gamma. So if these two can't see each other and, and the next, um, and similarly, uh, the two neighbors, two consecutive neighbors uh, of the of the green domain. Right here's a green domain. Here's another copy of the green domain. Here's the red domain. Um, if they never can see each other, then I can just construct a, a, a convex domain bounded by uh, pieces or, or copies of pieces of the of the convex hull of uh, k gamma and k gamma prime. K gamma prime being. Right, so piecing together piecing together um, of k gamma, k gamma prime, and convex hull of k gamma union k gamma prime minus k gamma and k gamma prime. We can create um, a tree of convex sets. And it is itself convex and acted on. I um, I hope this makes sense, and I'm going to stop here for the for this uh, part. If um, if you have questions, then please feel free. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments? So so this is sort of a combination theorem, right? And, uh, and then you, you can use this to prove the stability, is it the point you were making? Uh, right, so this whole, this whole uh, tree of convex sets construction is, uh, is by nature stable under small deformation, because what, what you have to check is this, uh, this horizon property that, uh, that I need a color, that little convex sets are behind the horizon for one another. They can't see each other, and therefore the, I mean, the the tree of convex sets is going to look like copies of k gamma hidden from each other by copies of k gamma prime hidden from each other by, by copies of k gamma and so on. So it's kind of challenging to draw this in a way that that still looks convex, but it's really it's really a tree whose vertices are convex sets, 
each co each convex set comes comes with an action of gamma or gamma prime, and uh, yeah, and, and they can't see each other. So yeah, the the key word is it's a combination theorem. So mask it gave some of the first ones uh, in H two or in H n, and we can we can make the same idea work in in P n using the the notion of convex co compactness discussed above. Okay, uh, any other questions?